Hello and a warm welcome to the Flying Reporter Pilot Briefing Podcast. This is where I bring you up to date with the most pertinent general aviation news and regulation changes. Importantly, I try to keep these updates factual and to the point, making it easier for you to keep on top of your game. Today, we'll talk about birds, the feathered variety that is, and the hazards they can cause to aviation. Mandatory reports. I'll have examples of things you must tell the regulator. And yet another airfield under threat from housing developers. This Flying Reporter Pilot Briefing podcast is sponsored by AOPA UK and made in association with Astral Aviation Consulting. So welcome along. Happy New Year. And before we get underway with our first item, a little announcement. This video version of the Pilot Briefing podcast is on the move. I've set up a new YouTube channel called the Flying Reporter Briefing Room. The Briefing Room is the new place for all this geeky stuff. (laughs) Regulation updates, deep dives, interviews and so on. So if you want to keep watching these pilot briefings, please go and subscribe to that channel now. The link should be on your screen. It's certainly in the video description, or you can just search YouTube for the Flying Reporter Briefing Room. I've got some interesting plans for the future of this new channel, so do ensure you subscribe to that. If you don't, you might miss out on future episodes of the podcast briefing that we're doing today. This episode of the Pilot Briefing is showing now over on the new channel. So why don't you pop over there now, subscribe and watch the rest of this episode there. And a little incentive for you, that version of this video is advert free. Also, did you know that the Flying Reporter Pilot Briefing is available to stream as a podcast on your preferred podcasting platform like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, for example. So that's another way to get your monthly update. You have been warned, this is the last time the pilot briefing will appear here on the main Flying Reporter channel. So let's get underway with our first item today, and I want to talk about bird strikes. It occurred to me flying from Red Hill the other day that I'm perhaps not taking the risks from wildlife seriously enough. With the weather being as it has been of late, wet and windy, and consequently less aircraft flying, the birds, mainly crows actually in the case of Red Hill, got quite comfortable on those grass runways and taxiways. In fact, Red Hill has a NOTAM out at the moment warning about this. Now, I'm fortunate only to have had one actual bird strike so far. For those watching this video version of the podcast, I'll play that short clip. But for those that can't see it, it was a tiny bird. It must have been a sparrow or something like that that hit the canopy of this robin uh, that uh, myself and instructor Nigel were flying last year. Thankfully, no damage, but it certainly had the effect of startling us. And I think that's a problem worth noting in its own right. So why am I mentioning this now? Well, several reasons actually, and it ties into two of the subjects I want to talk to you about today. The first is an air accident investigation branch report into a Sky Ranger Swift that collided with a hedge shortly after takeoff from a field near Dunstable last September. Now, according to the report, just after becoming airborne, the pilot saw a heron flying towards him. He thought it was going to change course. It didn't. He banked left to avoid it. He did miss it. The bird just missed the windscreen. Few, the pilot must have thought, but unfortunately, another bird hit the propeller. The engine coughed for a few seconds, continued to run, but the pilot reported there was a loss of power. He was able to turn to avoid the tallest trees that were coming up fast towards him, and he maintained airspeed. But he could see that he was going to hit bushes, so just prior to colliding with the hedge there, he shut the engine down and the aircraft settled into the hedge, causing minimal damage actually, and no injuries thankfully. He'd actually hit a pigeon, and there were remains of the pigeon on the propeller, and in the field that he'd just taken off from. Now, in the circumstances, the pilot seems to have done a great job here of flying the aeroplane rather than trying to outclimb that hedgerow as it came towards him without the necessary performance to do so. I mean, the risk, of course, there would have been he could have stalled it and the crash could have been far more serious than it ended up being. He puts his success down to making a habit of briefing the actions to take in the event of an engine failure after takeoff before every departure, something we all should do really, of course. 
So is there anything we can do ourselves to reduce the risks of bird strikes? Well, a CAA Safety Sense leaflet 10C, it's quite old, but there's some good info in there. It's called Bird Avoidance. Now, what does this say? Firstly, it says to check NOTAMs. Uh, so check to see if there's any reported bird activity, uh, like the one at Redhill that I mentioned. It says, generally speaking, cruise as high as you can. Only 1% of bird strikes occur above two and a half thousand feet. It uh, recommends not flying over wildlife sanctuaries. We can often see those on the uh, aviation charts. Avoid flying low along rivers, shorelines, and be cautious around inland waters and shallow estuaries. The most likely time actually for bird strikes apparently is July and August in the UK when many inexperienced young birds are about. If birds are observed on the aerodrome, see if the airfield can disperse them before you take off. If you do have a bird strike, as in the case we mentioned uh, just now, fly the aeroplane. If the windshield is broken, slow down to reduce the wind blast. If you suspect structural damage or damage to the aircraft controls, you might need to check what controls you have or what's working, what isn't when you're at a safe height before you start slowing yourself down to make your approach. Finally, if you see birds as you're on final approach, make an early decision to go around. They may well have moved on when you come for a second go. And I think that last point is actually a really good one. Um, I wish I'd known that before. I've had it where birds are all over the runway uh, just as I'm coming in to land. And I've continued hoping, oh, they'll hear me in a minute and they'll fly off or they'll see my landing light or whatever. But invariably they, 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 they won't. Um, po possibly they will right at the last second and then they're all scattering everywhere, aren't they? Uh, and while I haven't hit any while making an approach, thankfully, so far, it has certainly been a distraction. And I've, I remember landing at Easter Airfield up in Scotland and there were birds at the threshold and they scattered like I just mentioned. I got distracted by them and then I had a bit of a botched landing. I bounced and then I ended up having to go around anyway. <laughs> so some interesting thoughts there in that safety sense leaflet about birds, the risk of a bird strike and what to do if you have one. And there's something else we need to do if we have a bird strike actually, and we'll cover that in a moment. First though, I'd like to thank AOPA UK for sponsoring this episode of the Pilot Briefing Podcast. I'm a member of AOPA and I would love it if you could join as well. Now, whenever I talk to pilots about this, it's interesting. They often say, well, what do I get from AOPA from my subscription? It doesn't look like you get a great deal. Well, yes, we all want something for our money, don't we? But when it comes to AOPA, the benefits of being a member can be tricky to quantify, actually. You see, the main benefit that I see with AOPA is the work that they do on behalf of all of us in general aviation. They're constantly fighting our corner with governments and the regulators. They take on the issues that affect us. For example, just this last week, I heard that AOPA met with the CEO of the CAA, the UK's uh, aviation regulator, to talk to them about just culture. We have this thing called just culture in aviation. Now, pilots are having their licenses suspended in some cases because they've been reported via the MOR system, the mandatory reporting process for infringements into controlled or other regulated airspace. Now, IOPA thinks this is problematic because for a just culture to work, pilots need to have faith and confidence that they're not going to be arbitrarily punished for reporting safety incidents. Because if they think they're going to have their licenses suspended or worse still, prosecuted by the CAA, they're less likely to report things. Furthermore, the MOR system actually isn't supposed to be used to punish pilots, but yet that's exactly what it seems to be doing. Controllers file an MOR against a pilot, the CAA is onto them straight away, it might send them on a course, in some cases suspend them. If you're lucky, you might get away with a warning. So it's an issue and AOPA is working on it for the benefit of all of us. And that's why I'm a member, not for any tangible benefit that I can get for my subscription, but for the good work it does for general aviation as a whole. Flying Reporter followers can get a 25% discount on new one or two year AOPA UK subscriptions now. Details of how to claim your discount are on the screen in the show notes or on the Flying Reporter website. And that neatly brings us to our next topic, occurrence reporting. So we were just talking about bird strikes, weren't we? And I wonder if you knew that if you had a bird strike and it caused damage to your aircraft, there's a requirement for you to report it. You'd have to file 
an MOR or a mandatory occurrence report. There are a whole host of things that you have to report and some of these examples might surprise you. Runway excursions or runway incursions have to be reported. So if you land, lose control a little and stray off to the edge of the runway, that's an MOR. A loss of any part of the aircraft structure or installation in flight. So I suppose if you lost an inspection panel, that probably ought to be reported. A collision on the ground with another aircraft, terrain or obstacle. So a taxiing collision, for example, no matter how minor, has to be reported. We've already mentioned bird strikes, but in fact any collision with wildlife that causes aircraft damage needs to be submitted as an MOR, as does any occurrence leading to an emergency call. Now there are many other events that you're obliged to report and a recent Safety Sense leaflet from the CAA gives lots of examples. It also tells you how to submit an MOR. I filed a few in my time. I'm trying to remember now. I had, um, I had a small engine fire on startup many years ago. That was an MOR. I had to make a pan call once and that was an MOR too. MORs actually are only legally required if you're flying a Part 21 aircraft like a Cessna 172 or a PA-28, but commanders of all aircraft types, regardless of whether they're Part 21 or not, are strongly encouraged to make the reports. It's all supposed to improve safety. Actually, you can apply to read the MOR reports, and I do, and they make for interesting reading. There are rules around sharing the information that's in there, but a really good thing to do because you can see some trends, you can see where people are having problems, see how people are dealing with incidents. To be honest, the whole process of reporting MORs could be easier. The website for submitting them is a bit clunky. Not as bad as Selma, the system we have to use for our medicals, but it's still not great, to be honest. The service is called a CARES 2, and you can find it at www.aviationreporting.eu. That's www.aviationreporting.eu. Now, the Pilot Briefing podcast is made in association with Astral Aviation Consulting, who work with the UK CAA to offer safety resources to general aviation pilots. They help me with the research for these briefings. Astral is actually running a workshop for private pilots later this month called Beyond the PPL. This will explore what opportunities are available to you once you've got your flying licence. You can sign up for the workshop on their website at Astral Aviation Consulting. Dot com, astral aviation consulting dot com. You'll find the workshop under the upcoming events tab. Finally, for today, some airfield news. And I don't know why I'm smiling, I shouldn't be. Um, from time to time, I'll include some updates from the General Aviation Awareness Council, an association that represents the interests of UK airfields. The reason why I shouldn't be smiling is that pilots and aircraft owners based at Popham in Hampshire have raised their concerns after it came to light that the airfield was being considered in the local council's draft local plan for the building of 3,000 homes. Here we go again. Another airfield under threat, and I do wonder when somebody will get a grip of this problem. Now, for those that aren't familiar with Popham, it's a grass airstrip 15 miles north of Southampton with a very active grassroots aviation community, probably one of the, the biggest grassroots aviation community in the country, I suspect. I filmed actually um, one of my aerodrome reviews there just over a year ago, and you can go and check that out and see it for yourself. Basingstoke and Dean Borough Council say that Popham Garden Village will be a healthy and sustainable place with a strong village character. It will have a village centre, a range of retail, leisure, cultural community, health and service facilities, and permanent gypsy and traveller pitches. The draft local plan says that new settlements such as this are supported by the National Planning Policy Framework. I smell a bit of a rat here because this is the same framework that states that planning policy should recognise the importance of maintaining a national network of general aviation airfields, something the planners seem to have overlooked in this case, as it's not referred to at all, as far as I can, say, uh, can, can see, in the council's local plan. The draft local plan will be put out for a six-week consultation very soon, and I'm sure that pilots across the UK will be making their feelings known. Well, that concludes this month's Pilot Briefing podcast. Thanks to AOPA UK for sponsoring the feature, to Astral Aviation Consulting for helping me research it, and also to you for listening and watching. Remember that to watch future episodes of the Pilot Briefing, 
subscribe to my new channel, The Flying Reporter Briefing Room. I hope to see you there next month. Until then, fly safely, my friends. Bye for now.